Listen to the sound of footsteps in the dark, to voices that may not be quite human, to the sound of screams in the night, to the haunted cabaret, the home of all things horror, on Rhode Island Free Radio.org, with your host, George Garner. The Haunted Cabaret starts now. Come on, boys! That was the New York Dolls. This is George Garner and the Haunted Cabaret. As a matter of fact, though, Tony, and it's Tony Jones as always behind the board. Uh, actually, we're the only ones in the studio this evening. Not even the weirdos are here downstairs. Yeah. We usually have, yeah, I'm trying to think of another word, but no. Put it this way. For, for Tony Jones to call people weirdos, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Is kind of I like, resemble that remark. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we do. Yes, we do. The only thing that comes close to that is when uh, they asked George Romero of Night of the Living Dead fame what he thought of Stephen King, and he said, "Oh, that guy's weird." <laughs> so, so yes, what a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, speaking of weird, uh, we have to mention the passing right up at the top here of uh, Charles David Manson. Cassidy. 
<laughs> is David Cassidy still with us? He is uh, either passed away today or is like close, close to passing away. Ah, He's in rough shape. How about Sean Cassidy? That, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How about the rest of the Partridge family? <laughs> well, Danny, Bon Danny, he's gone, right? Yeah, uh, he, he, he drugged himself yeah. to death long ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, no, it's somebody even more significant than David Cassidy that I was about to mention, and that is Charlie Manson. Now, who, listening to this show, doesn't have a soft place in their heart for Charlie Manson? I mean, not only... Did he inspire the Beach Boys? The Beach Boys. <laughs> or was it, no, he was inspired by the Beach yeah, Boys, Tony. Yeah. You got it backwards there, buddy. He was inspired by the Beach Boys. Of course, his musical career never came to anything. Well, until Guns N' Roses tried to record one of his songs just for the yeah, sake of... I think um, Gigi Allen did a few. and Yeah, I mean, yeah, just for the sake of notoriety. I mean, those... Charles Manson's skills were elsewhere. <laughs> I mean, if you wanted a bad acting heiress to be sliced up, you call Charles Manson. If you wanted work on your lyrics and yeah. you, no, go elsewhere. But um, actually, the you know the best thing you can say about Charles Manson is at least he didn't um, order the killing of, let's say, I don't know, uh, who's a great female actress back then, um, Catherine Hepburn or something, <laughs> right? You know, he's, no, it, it was Sharon Tate. I mean. Did he have her killed for like political reasons or because he just hated her acting? I'm not sure. I think. Well, there was Tate LaBianca, right? That's I'm actually this is a while back. I mean, I'm gonna have to test my memory here. <laughs> yeah, the Tate La, La Bianca murders, right? That's what they were called. Yeah. And yeah, Sharon Tate was the actress. Now, who was what was the La Bianca half of that hyphen? Was was that a movie producer? Was that a I think wasn't it just um, someone that's kind of like at the wrong place at the wrong time? Oh, it was kind of like a nineteen sixties version of nineteen, an early version of uh, O.J. Simpson. Yeah, like like that, like that doofus that yeah, that got killed at the same time as O.J.'s old yeah, lady. Yeah, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. I don't know if I was going to be killed by O.J. Simpson or Charles Manson and his crew. I think I'd go with Charles Manson and his crew. But, I mean, that's just my subjective opinion. They also wanted to assassinate Jerry Ford at the time, right? Uh, hmm. That was supposed to be the second part of the... Uh, that's That rings a bell, yeah. but... Okay, now, why on earth would they want... Why did they want to assassinate Jerry Ford? The, <laughs> the guy was a non-entity, even yeah, as a president. I know. I mean, why not assassinate... Um, Probably because he's the easiest to get to. I mean, nobody's worried about protecting Jerry Ford. <laughs> that's, true. that's true. He was right. He he was such he was so bland that you know nobody would even think yeah. of the possibility that he might get done in. Yeah, I mean, unlike our politicians today. I mean, that's why you know under the music I said you know. By the way, it was Tony Jones that picked Babylon to lead off this show. <laughs> um, these segues don't just happen. They. They're inspired. Sometimes they do, but sometimes they are inspired. Okay, I admit it. Yeah, <laughs> so sometimes. But uh, yeah, I mean, Babylon, that could be describing our studio. That could be describing <laughs> this neighborhood. This neighborhood. <laughs> that, well, no, I don't think people have as much fun in this neighborhood as, <laughs> as they used to. <laughs> no, this is more of a Charles Manson stalking uh, <laughs> area of the neighborhood. But uh, yeah, it certainly describes our country. I mean,. But the, funny, but the funny thing is, Tony, you said that, you know, before I came in, you were debating because you were putting the set list together for tonight's show between, you know, Babylon, New York Dolls and Alice Cooper's Lost in America. Yeah. And you went with and I agree completely that you went with Babylon instead of Lost in America because Alice Cooper was preaching. You know, he was complaining about the condition of America. Yeah. The New York Dolls are celebrating <laughs> the degenerate condition right? of America. Just go with it. <laughs> you go with it. Kind of like an old question that I remember being asked by somebody. Would you prefer living in... You know what? I remember this question being asked on the movie Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> when uh, one of the nerds, when they were having that party in their frat house and mm -hmm. everybody was stoned, the question was, would you prefer living in the ascendancy of a civilization or in its decline? <laughs> and the answer is, I mean, if you, until you think about it, 
Right. You, your tendency would be normally to say, in its ascendancy, you know, things are getting better. Yeah. But in, in the ascendancy of a civilization, there's also a lot more war. There's also a lot more fighting. There's, there's also a lot, of, a lot of work, too. A I lot mean, of work. a lot of work to be done. Right. I mean, you can't just sit around like we do <laughs> and, you know, talk to our heart's content, um, you know, play video games, um, re- indulge in music, um, sit in basements. You, do, you, you just can't do that when the... No. I mean, there's there's food to be grown. Work there's to be done, yeah. Buildings to be built. Get the civilization going. Yeah. Now, in the decline of the civilization where we are now, yeah, I mean, you can do these just things. Write it down. Yeah. I mean, we have... I My guess would be if you... Look at the old Roman Empire; it was in decline for at least a couple of hundred years. Yeah. You know, before the you know the foreign elements and the invaders finally took over. So I would say we got at least a couple of hundred more years, Tony, to sit around here enjoying ourselves, sitting on our asses, you know, doing pretty much nothing and some, some more coliseums. We already have the Providence Civic Center; it's already set up. I, all you got to do is release a lion in one of those hallways. Oh, that place! Jeez, yeah. <laughs> you know what? That's probably what it remembers resembles the most. I mean, we, we were there last week for Comic Con, and that was my general impression because, well, Providence Civic Center rechristened the Dunk Center, you know, for the prevalence of Dunkin' Donuts is in Rhode Island, <laughs> but. Yeah, I mean, if there was ever a civic arena that resembles either a fallout shelter you know, or a you know, bomb shelter or just one of those underground cities yeah. from, you know, dystopian science fiction, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, you know, if you wanted to film another version of 1984 or, you know, maybe Logan's Run or, you know, Planet of the Apes Underground, I mean, that the place to go is Providence. The only worst example here locally is the Warwick campus of the Community College of Rhode Island, which Jeez, literally that, looks like bombed out World War II. I, I don't know about bombed out. It looks to me like kind of maybe, well, speak, well yeah, World War II, yes. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe like uh, Nazi SS Gestapo <laughs> headquarters. I mean, and I kid you guys not, if, if anybody wants to, you know, yeah, by all means, Google a picture of uh, Community College of Rhode Island in Warwick. You tell me what that looks like. Or and it, it's it's literally it's concrete. As someone that's taken classes there, or if you've been to an event there, it's literally torture to get to the building as a straight uphill walk, and right, uh, right. it's just torture to to be in the building. It's like some kind of a prison. Yeah, and there's usually dripping water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it doesn't look. Enough like a Nazi headquarters with all that concrete and steel. Yeah, um, yeah just try to sit in one of those rooms. <laughs> try to relax in one of those corridors yeah. with the, the slow drip of Chinese water torture quality water. You know, making little puddles on the ground, you know, in those corridors. In a row, you know, that, that's what I just noticed, actually, is that, that uh, the Civic Center and the Warwick campus there have a, a highway that just go right through the middle of it. <laughs> I'll tell you if what we need. I'll tell you, you know, I've gotten my hands finally on some video equipment. The time is coming when I am going to put my uh, actions where my words have been for all these all these years and all this time. The time is coming when I begin filming of my own horror film, and I think we have settings aplenty. Oh yeah, an embarrassment of riches. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the second. What, what do you call it? The second. Um, you know the, the the scene shooting and the uh, there's the first and the second. Tony, you know about this. <laughs> you know you know about video. You have the student loans to show it. <laughs> you are going to be my guide in these things. But is it the second crew that goes out and films all the uh, static? Oh yeah, the landscapes B-roll and, and yeah. uh, the outside, the outside scenery yeah. and all that type of thing. Yeah. What we're going to have to do is just we're going to have to hit the trail here in Rhode Island and northeastern Connecticut. Believe me, there's some up there. (laughs) And, yeah, we're just going to – I think what we'll do is we'll let the scenery be the story's guide. (laughs) You know, we're just going to film all this stuff. We might not even need actors or a story. Now, I've seen – We might just need like an hour of footage of desolate, devastated scenes in – Rhode Island and uh, southern New England. Now, I've seen the opposite happen in independent films is that 
it's supposed to be this you know psychological thriller or this horror movie yet they're filming outside on a beautiful new england spring day with birds chirping in the background and sun in the uh, sky right <laughs> talk and then, about not setting the mood right and then they go indoors and try to shoot a few scenes with actors and actresses that just refuse to cooperate with the director <laughs> because they're working for free yeah and uh, she's not going to do- uh, the best example ever was um and See, you know how people usually say, you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to name any names? Well, I do. <laughs> was, I forget, luckily for the director, I forget his name. But the name of the homegrown project was, it was called Hometown. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, I went to the premiere of it. I went to the fundraiser for it. Uh, I had, you know, again, if, if somebody is doing the work, and I, and I told him this personally, he said, what do you think of the movie? I said, well, I can see you put a lot of work, time and effort and work into it. <laughs> Not enough. But, <laughs> but I said, you know, somebody's doing the work. They have my respect. Yeah. And they do. It only lost a little of my respect when uh, they're cribbing a scene from the original Carrie. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a woman covered with blood and she gets in the bathtub and she's trying to wash all the blood off her. The only problem was he couldn't get her to be naked. <laughs> and... He didn't know how to shoot angles. Yeah. I mean, there's there's two ways to shoot naked women in bathtubs. Yeah. Either you can do the Alfred Hitchcock thing and with very, very selective yeah. camera angles shadows and editing. And, yeah. Right, shadows, editing. Right, you can imply naked without ever showing yeah. it. Or you can talk the bitch into being naked. <laughs> he couldn't do either one. Fair. So what we had was... You know, a woman in a bathtub washing off the blood in a uh, green in a green bathing suit. <laughs> So, <laughs> see, at that point, you just move the scene to uh, you know a pool or a hot tub, or pretty much you know she just comes across the first body of water she finds. But to right. have it still be in the tub, <laughs> right? You insist, right? You insist on following your script to the letter, but the actors refuse to join you in doing it. That's yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, so I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with scenery, and we're go- and we're going to see where that takes us now. To tie two things in, starting with your journey in film and also my student loans, uh-huh. I took some fairly expensive film classes, great classes. I learned a ton from them. Right. However, at the end of the seminar, at the end of the classes, you had the option to buy a DVD of all the lectures. Uh-huh. Now, if I knew that was an option, I wouldn't have attended and spent all this money to attend a film seminar if I could have just watched it in the comfort of my own home, but I think I still have those expensive DVDs that went along with the expensive class somewhere. So yeah, the only pro- I'll save you. I'll lump these two loans, and I'll save you that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also have significant student loans from, uh, you know, not from film class, but from uh, web design class and uh, multimedia. Mm-hmm. I, I well, I went to New England Tech, so it had the big long fancy name of multimedia and web design. <laughs> and again, yeah, I give credit where it's due. I learned a lot. I mean, Photoshop, I mean, people get aggravated by the complexity of that. I can I can design on that all day mm-hmm. long. So, uh, you know, photography, I learned a lot of skills. Yeah, so was it worth it? Yes. Sure. Do I have the money to pay back the friggin' <laughs> loan? No. <laughs> but anyway, as far as, as far as, um, when you're talking about the DVDs, the only problem with DVDs, and I don't learn good by them, like I, I just don't, because the problem is, the diff- and I think that's why a lot of these colleges that are selling their, you know, degrees online, you, you can, you know, be an online student mm-hmm. and get a degree, you miss about half of it because teaching is supposed to be interactive. Yeah. Um, as I wish I could give the person credit that said this first, but I'll say it and take the credit for it. Teaching. <laughs> A teacher and student is a relationship experience. Mm-hmm. Now we don't. Now some of the relationships are a little unethical. We're, <laughs> not, we're not talking about those. We're not talking about where, you know sex organs or anything. No, but just the simple fact of you know sitting in a classroom like you're supposed to. Teachers up at the front of the classroom where they're supposed to stay, and not have their hands all over you. <laughs> just plain teach a student in a classroom. It's a relationship. In other words. The biggest part of that relationship is you, the student, get to ask questions. Yeah. Without the questions, I think, you know, any classroom, any DVD, any learn, any attempt to learn, you lose half of it. 
I mean, without the ability to ask questions. I mean, well, unless you stop the DVD and then <laughs> what text the instructor that made the DVD or the school that released it or. And so, the first so, thing they're going to want to know is if you're paid up on your loans, so you're screwed again. Right, and now, right, and now when you let them, then you say, uh, "Not quite." <laughs> you know, there's a collection agency hounding me, <laughs> you know, for my default. Um, yeah, then right, then you're not you're not going to get to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> the only question you're going to get to ask is probably like the you know the, the next g- time you're getting paid. <laughs> yeah. You know, or um, you get to beg for mercy from the uh, library cop like Gestapo like, you know, agent that's going to come from that, you know, CCRI or that tech school and, <laughs> and just basically, you know, do a, uh, oh, well, I'm, I'm Italian on my father's side. I'll just say do a mafia number, <laughs> you know, yeah, to just to encourage you to pay back those student loans. So, um, Although is this well, we're all we're all done because we're past the point where we could get mercy in the uh, form. Isn't the government telling kids now that if you go into certain fields, they'll cancel your student loan or give yeah, you a break te- on the student loan? Teach for America's one. I think there's a few medical fields, and it depends on yeah. to uh, you know a Teach for America. You would. To qualify, you would teach in you know Central Falls or right. Providence or something right. In like other that. words, teach in certain get you know certain careers and then right. carry out those careers yeah. in certain places. It's more you know, it's almost like a you know what a traditional benefit would be for if right. someone had a pension or right, like, kind of like the Peace Corps of yeah. the old days, yeah. but in the United States, which is looking more like a third world country yeah. than the third world companies countries where they used to have the Peace Corps, <laughs> right? So, which makes sense to me. You said teaching, though. Do you think this show would qualify as teaching? Do you think uh, I could get like credits for my student uh, loans I mean, for this show? If you've been to some public schools, um, <laughs> it would be, <laughs> improve- a good be an improvement. <laughs> yeah, actually, the stu- actually yes. I mean, this studio is a big improvement. <laughs> you know, to some, you know, kudos to Chuck, our landlord, because yeah, this studio where we're doing this show right now is, I would say, about. Uh, the off- I would say about ninety percent better than the condition of most yeah. classrooms in the uh, I know middle school and high school level in Rhode Island. Yeah. Uh, probably elementary school too. Are the little kids dodging rats at this point too? Uh, you know, there's no water leaking. There's uh, no uh, no asbestos that we know of. Right, right. I, I understand that um, a couple of people went into the high schools in Providence and they. You know, the auditorium where there's the curtains and the stage and everything. Apparently, those those curtains have been partially eaten by vermin. <laughs> uh, East Providence is in rough shape, too. Well, East Providence has a tremendous stench about the whole, almost the whole city. <laughs> East Providence, uh, from what I understand, I used to wonder why that was. You know what I'm saying? Was there some kind of Lovecraftian elder monsters like, you know, like under the soil of East <laughs> Providence? No. It turns out that East Providence didn't have enough piss and shit of their own. <laughs> So when Barrington, whose shit proverbially doesn't stink, <laughs> and that's probably how they fooled East Providence into taking their share yeah. too and for treat for the treatment at the sewage treatment plant, yeah, somehow Barrington, with persuasive talk and a few dollars, convinced East Providence to take their sewage. Yeah, and now East somewhere. yeah, and, and now East Providence stinks. <laughs> <laughs> they have a few dollars more in the uh, political general fund yeah. and. Uh, Lower taxes, a little bit lower taxes, and half the place stinks, so nobody wants to move there. You get used to it, I suppose. <laughs> but I, I, well, when the wife and I, uh, who was girlfriend at the time, when we were looking for a house a couple of years back, I don't know. We smell some stenches that <laughs> I'm not quite sure we could ever get used to. And as a matter of fact, the. Uh, real estate agent that was showing us around she says yeah she said there's a couple of streets in east providence i don't even show houses on it's never a good sign when the uh, real estate agent shows up with a clothespin on her nose <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then i don't know maybe it was you know to try to counter the smell of sewage but the house the empty house we were looking at that the real estate agent was showing us in east providence next door there was like a white trash family <laughs> and they had big piles of garbage oh that's great you know around their yard so I'm wondering if they maybe it's because they just prefer the smell of rotting garbage, you know, to the smell of rotting sewage. You know, it's just you know, it's a slight different yeah. a preference, slight preference. 
Anyway, all right, let's get back to the music because you know what? Tony Jones has dug up some deep tracks that we, I really want to make sure we get through by the end of tonight's show. Let's go to, you know, let's do some Pig Destroyer. We haven't had that on in a while. Uh, they're doing a little cover tune called Down in the Streets here on the Haunted Cabaret on Rhode Island Free Radio. <laughs> Segwaying us into a conversation, which I think is appropriate upon the demise of Charles Manson. Evilest, evilest human being, Tony. Um, now, Charles Manson gets a lot of print and ink. I don't know. I mean, I don't think he's. I don't think he does. I don't think he's, he comes close to the evilest human being. Really, <laughs> do you? No, I mean, no, not at all. No, I mean, first of all, his body count was low. Yeah. Second of all, he didn't do it himself. Although, you know, he did a pretty good number on the minds of his followers. Yeah. I mean, you know, cult leaders, you know, are always diabolical. But um, I don't know. Even Jim Jones, I think, bet is him, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I was thinking about this because this is, you know, the sort of thing I sometimes think about when I'm just walking around, you know, looking at the green grass and the pretty flowers. Sounds and, like a good uh, third shift uh, thought to have. Thought to have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if this had been... If this broadcast had been tomorrow instead of right now, I'd, I would have had all third shift tonight when I'm working to, you know, probably come up with a list, you know, top 10. But I do pretty good off the top of my head, too. 
the only problem is that even off the, whether it's off the top of my head or a well considered list, unfortunately, at the top is going to be a cliche because Adolf Hitler, right, is top of the list. Right, top of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, yeah. the top Nazis. I mean, you can't beat that. Uh, I was going to go a little bit more modern and say Pol Pot. Okay. I can see that. Yeah, in other words, the same idea of genocide. Yeah, just straight up genocide. Of, right. With the idea that you're saving the world, which is scary. Right. I think with Charles Manson, I mean, he knew what he was doing was evil. These guys are coming at it from a practical uh, moral supremacy almost, you know? Right. Yeah, because Charles Manson called himself the Lord of the Pit. Yeah. So therefore you knew what right, you knew what kind of side of the moral universe he was yeah. he knew he was in, he that he was working from. The only reason though that I put Hitler still above Pol Pot and I mean Joseph Stalin's up there too. Yeah. I mean he murdered you know millions of his own people, never mind everybody else. Yeah. But um the reason I still put Hitler and the Nazis up at the top is because of the industrial way they went about it. You know, in other words, they made an industry out of genocide. Yeah. In other words, you know, even Pol Pot, Stalin, yes, they sent their troops and their flunkies, you know, to commit mass murder, but it wasn't such a well thought out by the book, year improvised, not improvised, but carefully constructed year by year project. Yeah. In other words, Hitler and the Nazis went about genocide like someone following a blueprint building a house and they also started thinking about two generations out which is why they started hitler youth so they were i mean i can barely make it through a couple days these guys were of, thinking generations ahead right of a couple of days of being single-mindedly in pursuit of something right right and but that i think that's what that's what the difference maker is you know between the nazis and all these other you know fanatics and mass murderers is that well, that's another good question, though, to interrupt myself. Do you think Hitler and the, you know, Goering and Himmler and all those people, did they know it was evil? Mm. Or that Hitler, I don't, Hitler, I don't think so. Yeah, because I, I think he was pathological. Now, he wasn't insane. You know, because people say, oh, Hitler, he was, he was a madman. He wasn't mad. He wasn't insane in the clinical sense of the word. In other words, you wouldn't put him in a mental institution. Yeah. Because... I mean, he was very clear-minded on what he wanted to do. I think he's, he was more in the category of, you know, the genuine so, uh, sociopath, psychopath. Yeah. Other, because, yeah, I mean, there's something about still that industrial way that by the numbers, that step-by-step -step process, and maybe it's the word process I'm looking for, the way they went about what they went about. And, yeah, the, as it was, they World War II, by the time they were done, the whole war just elim eliminated 100 million people. Uh, the Nazis themselves, uh, they well, the, the typical number is they six, 6 million Jews in the mm -hmm. concentration camps, about 9,000 a day. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like you said, Tony, it's not only let's get this done right now, you know, for we're doing some thrill killing. It wasn't just thrill killing. They had a generational plan. Yeah. And another thing what a lot of people overlook is that the only thing that stopped Adolf Hitler from murdering maybe like 10 times that number of 100, 100 million is that they lost World War II. Yeah. Um, after the war, they found, you know, people have found out that the Nazis had plans for basically eliminating the entire population of Russia. Yeah. And then resettling it with trained Nazis, you mm -hmm. know, the Hitler youth all grown up. So, and the plan was, you know, they weren't going to bother with concentration camps or anything in Russia. They would just go and uh, let them starve to death. Yeah. In other words, take away all the resources, anything that could keep people alive and just let the entire population of Russia starve to death. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think both for scope of vision and method of carrying out said vision, I think, you know, like I say, cliche though it is, you know, and, and easy answer though it is, I think, you know, Hitler still is on the top. Um, 
of course, you have to rule out genuine madmen, mad men and mad women, yeah. right? If they're mentally disturbed, then, you know, which is the exact reason that, you know, you don't want to say Hitler was a madman because that excuses. Yeah. If a person is mentally disturbed, then they're excused from their actions. They're not responsible yeah. for them. But, I don't know, I would... Then you have your religious fanatics. You know, you have your cultists. I don't know if you would call somebody like... See, I don't know. A lot of these terrorists, like Bin Laden and things like that, I don't know. Would you call them even... from the, Now, if you're an American who has a family member in the Twin Towers, right? Bin Laden is evil. Is he evil or is... You know, from their point of view, obviously, they're either fighting a religious war or they're fighting a political war. Yeah. Right? I mean... You know, from the point of view of the British, you know, the American patriots that launched the war for independence for the United States were evil. Yeah. Right? I mean, so. I forget who it's attributed to, but one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Yeah. Especially since the Americans wouldn't walk in a straight line and were hiding in the bushes and stuff. Yeah. And I'll tell you, and speaking of terrorism, have you ever hear of tar and feathering? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds hilarious, but. And I remember when I was in high school or middle school, whenever it is that they actually still taught these things. Apparently, tar and feathering was a little fun that was had by the American, the, the American independent-minded patriots yeah. you know, during the War for Independence. You would find somebody who didn't believe in your cause of independence, and then what you would do is you would get a big 50-gallon 50, uh, barrel one of those big wooden barrels that they would put wine in, I guess. And you would boil some hot oil or hot tar in the barrel. And then you'd dunk the person, your victim, in it, right? Cover them with hot tar and then throw them, throw them full of, you know, a few handfuls of chicken feathers on them. <laughs> it's, that's why, see, that's why, you know, that's why our American patriots have gotten away with this, Tony, because it sounds hilarious. <laughs> You're making giant chickens. Now, the thing is, too, we think of that in the context of um, modern, you know, a modern context where you think of someone being able to get in the shower and have running water afterwards. Right. Not the case during the revolutionary times, which means that tar and those feathers were on you for right. maybe f forever. I don't know, for years. Well, well, they weren't on you forever because what would happen is now the hot tar it would stick to your skin and it would dry. Yeah. What it would do when it was still hot was it would cook your skin so that the hot tar would come off when your friends peeled it off, but then your skin came yeah. with it. Yeah. So basically, I'm not quite sure how many layers of flesh you lost when they were trying to get you out of one of those tar and yeah. feather suits. But yeah, I, I don't think I, it was probably lethal, right? Without, without med modern yeah, medicine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you probably died of an yeah. infection yeah. pretty shortly afterwards. Yeah. yeah. But it, it sounds sounds cute. <laughs> <laughs> Although I've learned something about chick Now, as you know, I've moved up, you know, to the uh, quiet corner of Connecticut <laughs> where you're allowed to have farm uh, domestic animals right, yeah. to some extent. And not a lot. I mean, not a lot. You know, if you're in a neighborhood, you don't get to have cows and, you know, yeah. herds of cattle but, and but the people next door do have chickens. I never knew how violent chickens could be. <laughs> My wife was attacked by a chicken. <laughs> you talk about violence. You talk about unexpected attack. Yeah. She said she was out in the yard. She was out there trying to do the uh, the American middle class thing, you know, and like trim, you know, trim the painting the white picket fence. Uh, well, we don't have the white picket fence oh, yet. Oh, you're way behind. Well, actually, well, the people next door have a uh, purple fence that the wind blew down in the last storm. I'd like to put up just one picket. <laughs> That's a thought. <laughs> but yeah, no, she was she was doing the next best thing. She was trimming the weeds, you know, that on the edge of the driveway. She said so she's she's standing there with the trimmers, trimming the weeds, and all of a sudden some you know ancestral survival impulse makes her turn around. And she said Flying across the yard about two feet from the ground is a chicken. She's being a, a, a chicken is flying across the yard at her <laughs> with her when her, her back. It waited for her back to be turned, and it it took. Now I didn't even know chickens could fly. 
but apparently they can because this chicken like was about two feet off the ground flying like an arrow right at her back of course you know then when she turned around then she like waved the clippers at it yeah you know, it realized it had only a beak, and she had a. She was going to take its head off. She with pulled the, out some barbecue sauce. <laughs> I tell you, these chickens. Are, yeah, the, the neighbors. They have about. They have about eight or ten chickens or so. <laughs> they keep. I feel like I'm living next to Starlog Seventeen, the con, <laughs> like the prison camp. These chickens. They keep break. They break out. Wow. They keep breaking out of the coop. They fly. <laughs> fly the coop. Oh, I guess they can fly right because flew the coop. <laughs> so okay, now we know. Yeah, once they were, once they broke out and they attacked my wife, once they broke out and they were doing kind of a Black Lives Matter barricade of the driveway <laughs> so that nobody yeah. could leave the uh, common the common area driveway. There's a, few, there's a few turkeys in my area that do that. Yeah. Wild turkeys. Yeah, but I think, you know, I think they crossed the proverbial Rubicon when they, a bunch of them marched out into the street <laughs> and I think... I think that's when they learned that they're only chickens. <laughs> so, and since then, I think the owner, I guess, uh, we we just got a big kick out of the whole thing. So we didn't say anything to the owners. But I think somebody did. So those chickens now, they're behind like double barbed wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So that that's our adventure with uh, living out in the uh, rustic. <laughs> well, see, my wife insists that we're not living out in the country. We're living in the far edge of the suburbs. Yeah. 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 I mean, you have access to, you know, go to the store. and Right. Right. But my attitude is if you have a pen full of homicidal chickens <laughs> next door and that you wake up in the morning to the sound of a crowing rooster, yeah. you are in the country. If there's, yeah, if there's wildlife nearby and, and, you know, people aren't surprised by that, you're in the country. Yeah. You know, if, if she was in her old neighborhood and there was a line of chickens walking across, you know, Dexter Avenue – People would turn heads. <laughs> yeah, no, I think in Central Falls, I think the largest wildlife you see there is rats. And, <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, there's some. Well, there's some of the uh, Haitians and uh, you know people from the Caribbean islands, though. So you know those voodoo people. I think in, there is a chance of seeing chickens they in Central them in the Falls. Basement, yeah, yeah, they keep them in the basement and they only execute them on certain uh, yeah. important days and important nights. And they eat them. Well, I don't know. Do they eat them or <laughs> they just sacrifice them and burn them? <laughs> Oh, what do you do with a sacrificed chicken uh, in voodoo? I mean, you can't you can't let it go to waste. No, but I, I don't know. I always thought it'd be cool if you cut its head off, sacrificed it, and then like you conjured it up and it was walking around headless. <laughs> that would that'd be awesome. <laughs> kind of like um, in the there was an old Three Stooges episode. It was it was Three Stooges, Tony. I know On this and is, off, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's one of those things. I like actually this time of year, like the day after Thanksgiving, some of the channels will run a full day of the Stooges or a right. full day of. You know, whatever it may be. Right. But one of my favorites, and, you know, it's tough to describe a comedy routine, but look for the, if anybody's into old comedy, you know, like old 30s comedy, look for the Three Stooges episode where the Three Stooges are cooks in this fancy mansion. Hmm. And, the, you know, it's, I don't know if it's Thanksgiving or what the holiday is, but they're, you know, they're preparing a feast and they're cooking a turkey. And... The only thing they don't realize is that the family that they're working for had a par- has a parrot, huh. and the parrot escaped, and it hid inside the turkey. <laughs> so that you know, when Curly tries to stuff the turkey full of uh, bread and crackers, you know, the parrot keeps grabbing them out of his hand from the opening in the turkey, huh. and they bring out the they bring out the uh, turkey, you know, put it on the table. You know, stab it with the fork. The turkey squawks. You know, the parrot squawks. And what you got to see is what happens next. As you have to, I can't describe it. You have to see it when the parrot makes the turkey stand up on the table and start walking around the table. <laughs> you got to see that episode. I don't know. I don't know. You could Google. I don't. I can't remember what it's called. I mean, my nerd-like powers only go so far. <laughs> I, I don't remember what a Three Stooges episode with a walking cooked turkey is called but, but there's probably somewhere out there someone out someone there that does that does and that's yeah. why i mention it <laughs> <laughs> look into it the uh yeah the cooked turkey walking maybe google that <laughs> in the meantime speaking of yeah speaking of farm animals and domestic animals let's go back to the music uh, let's how about the melvins some night goat here on the haunted cabaret on rhode island free radio
That was Melvin's Night Goat. Only one of the domestic animals that I'm liable to see wandering around my house these days up in the quiet corner of Connecticut. Um, it wasn't so quiet the last couple of nights, though. Only uh, we had problem with the uh, boiler. Uh-oh. One of yeah, one of those um, one of those things that has the American dream, not all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> yeah, trouble that, with the in the uh, what's that? Especially since uh, you know, speaking of the American dream. One of the issues is when you need a plumber or you have a boiler problem, there's no tradesman anymore, so you can't get access to, in some cases to get Funny, I'll, I'll tell you, I, if I say this, now I hesitate whether I should say this on the air because if I do, I'm afraid that I'm going to get a tremendous migration of frustrated homeowners yeah. up to the otherwise quiet corner. Of course, it'll raise property values. It'll also raise my taxes, <laughs> but I'll, I'll say it anyway as a point of bragging. Um, taking the lead right from the White House, bragging is not a bad thing anymore. <laughs> no, um, what happened was, you know, because we bought an old, you know, nineteen ten house, you know, and we bought it from the estate of an old lady that had lived there for fifty years. Mm-hmm. You know, she hadn't done any maintenance on her, on whether it was the heating system. You know, for like, like I jokingly said, fifty years, yeah. but you know, but the uh, guy that, more like fifty five. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, the guy that came to deal with the problem didn't disagree with me. Said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he said, you know, every year or so, you know, you're supposed to make sure that you know the pipes and the joints yeah. and the ball bearings and everything are, you know, they're oiled and you know lubricated so yeah. that you know the equipment can work, you know, in the heating system. Apparently, he said they were like like bone, like kind of like I guess the you know the tomb of a pharaoh dry. <laughs> King Tut. Yeah, but the. But the thing that I hesitate to say, you know, as Lovecraft says, I should only hint at it, yeah. is how long it took this, you know, not a not a plumber, but you know who. Basically, yeah. I called the place where we get our oil deliveries from, and they said, "Oh, service department." So I don't know if you'd call the fellow a plumber yeah, I or think back uh, in the day, it'd be called a boiler maker. But I don't think that's. I think that's a drink. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tech. You know, I guess we'll call him a tech. Yeah. We called at noontime. Uh, he was there at 3.30. Wow. Yeah. It's unheard of. Yeah. Now, yeah, I, I almost, I regret that I said that already. My neck of the woods, you clog a toilet and you're uh, pooping outside for three weeks <laughs> if you want to get a plumber over. <laughs> yeah, but at least in your neck of the woods, you have a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Boop. <laughs> but, uh, you know what, what Tony, let's. I'm going to cut the chit chat and the bullshit short because <laughs> we have, like, like I said, you put together an awesome yeah, set list. We have a, I already have a set list on tap for next week. I'm just going to leave it right up, uh, right up. Yeah, on here. I mean, what do we got time for now? If we, if I shut my mouth and we, you know, <laughs> and I say good night right now, how long do we? What do we have? Ten minutes? Uh, we would have uh, six minutes. This. Yeah. All right. Uh, how much music can you jam into six minutes? <laughs> Uh, how, what's what's the what's the track time of uh, Emerald? Uh, it is four oh four. Okay, uh, let's because I know that's one of your favorite arena rock, uh, cheese rock yeah, songs. I have from, some of their vinyl. And by the way, we're talking about Thin Lizzy. For that's all some of vinyl you, that uh, is never going to go up in value. <laughs> <laughs> does it have the little? Uh, does it have the little notch taken out of the corner of the album? If it has the little notch taken out of the corner of the album, no, it's not going up in value. <laughs> if it doesn't, it has a chance. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Yeah, let's, we'll go with a little bit of Thin Lizzy to take us out, then plus whatever else Tony sticks in after it for as long as it lasts. <laughs> All right, but anyway, until next time, this is Thin Lizzy Emerald off the Jailbreak album here on the Haunted Cabaret on Rhode Island Free Radio. Nighty night. Their shields and their swords to fight the fight they believe to be right, overthrow the overlords to the towns where there was plenty. They brought plunder, swords, and flame. When they left, the town was empty, and children would never play again. Near the border 
Say it.